I'm Kevin Elmy. In this presentation, we're going to talk about soil health, and we're going to look at it from the bison producer perspective. So the first thing we should touch on is what is soil health? Dr. Chris Nichols defines it as the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. It is the continued capacity to function that is critically important and the roles that soil biological, chemical, physical, and geologically processes play in creating and maintaining these functions. That's the, the high level soil health definition. In Western Canada, our soils were developed with the co-evolution of plants and animals. And, and you know, this is the, the only way that uh, the animals were able to eat is through grazing. When humans that came to Western Canada and, and settled, it really disrupted some natural processes that were going on for thousands of years. First of all, the fertilizer usage, uh, what that does is fertilizer outsources biological cycles. So it, it outsources jobs for the microbes. Tillage reduces your organic matter and, and really, uh, really changes this, the, the, the makeup of the biological system that is developed in the soil with, between the, the fungi and the bac and bacteria. Using the just monocultures, they're very, very low diversity of, of plants, reduces the, the microbe diversity in our soils. And in, in, case, in most cases in Western Canada, we have lost the animal impact on our land. So why is soil health important? You know, you could, there's a bunch of reasons, but you know, when you look, break it down, you know, productivity. When we have soils that lose soil health, we lose productivity. So in order to get that productivity back, what we have to do is rely on some chemistry. We have to add fertilizer. When we look at the soil health, we look we talk about sustainability by putting on you know relying on on synthetics and, and getting away from the biological uh, processes, natural processes in our soils. Now we're going to question uh, you know how sustainable is that long term, and then profitability. Once again, when we when we start relying on adding inputs into it what does that do to our profitability our livestock health in through you know through the the, the whole process of of uh, intensifying the livestock operations as soon as we start losing soil health now we have to add more more uh, supplements to those animals we have to worry about diseases we're dealing with a lot of a lot of these issues and the most important thing in, in my mind is when we have declining soil health, we have declining human health. And so what ties the, the human health and the livestock health and the soil health is when we have soils that are not functioning properly, we then have the soil microbiology not act, acting properly or naturally. And we don't have that natural interaction between the soil microbes and the plants. And when we have that, then we have lower nutrient density in that plant, which then feeds both livestock and humans. So it's going to be something that once we get this soil health, we're going to have healthier plants, we're going to have healthier animals, we're going to have healthier humans. Soils in North America have lost between 30 and 70% of the organic matter where we started. We've we lost it through erosion whether it is erosion from water or from wind. We have lost it through oxidation, and that's through cultivation. So we've, we've lost it that way. And we've also lost it through the soil respiration. And the way that it, it, we lose it through the respiration is the microbes are, are, are busy doing their, their microbe things, doing living, and in order to have this carbon source that they need to keep surviving, where do they get it from? They get it from the organic matter. If we don't have a living root feeding carbon back into that soil. And I'm not saying you people are not doing it right. This is a picture from our farm and you don't see a living root. You don't see 
uh, you know, a lot of the soil health things, uh, this is where, you know, where we started. Uh, we were very conventional. So how do we do change? So this low organic matter soils, as, as that organic matter starts dropping, we need more fertilizer. We go from a flood to a drought or a drought to a flood within that same season. We see more disease. We see more bugs. We see more weeds. We see so, more soil compaction. We see lower water infiltration. And that list goes on. This is the reason why having uh, livestock integration and, and talking to you know this group is is great because you got the livestock now do we have that livestock having impact on our soils and a positive impact when we start talking about regenerative agriculture the whole background premise doesn't matter who you're talking to or you know what agenda they have basically what we're looking at is rebuilding our soil when I was talking to uh, the, the people from the USDA back 15 years ago, I was talking to Ken Miller, and, and one of the things that he said was, you know, at the time people were talking about sustainability. And he said, why should we sustain, so maintain, a resource that's already degraded? What we need to do is we need to build our soil. And how we rebuild our soil is we need to sequester carbon from the air and put it into the soil. We need to build organic matter. And by doing that, that's going to promote more soil microbes in our soil, more active. We're going to be fixing our water cycles, our carbon cycles, and our nutrient cycles. And we're going to increase our food quality. It's really easy to point the finger at carbon because carbon is, uh, is the bad guy environmentally in, in the media. But the number one greenhouse gas in the atmosphere right now is a nasty chemical called H2O. By increasing the carbon in our soil, what it's going to do is it's going to be able to store and hold more water in our soil to bring down the humidity in, in the atmosphere. And once again, we get more, more, more stored water in our soils. That's just going to give us more plant production in those in those uh, parts of the year where we're missing the rains. So building carbon in the soil is, is, is a huge, huge thing. And it's not at the top three inches, six inches. What we want to be doing is really extending that A horizon, that nice black part of soil if you're in the black soil zone. Uh, we want to extend that black uh, topsoil down deep. We want to get down, see if we can get those roots down to, you know, a meter. That's what the goal should be. So the, the ELMI 5 soil health principles, it, and the reason why I've said, okay, this is the ELMI 5, because if you listen to different speakers, they're going to have different, different, uh, different angles on it. Uh, for me, I've combined a few of them because I think they're, they're redundant, but I've added one. But anyways, so number one, keep a living root of a plant that's in the vegetative stage throughout that whole growing season. That's one of the crucial things that in my mind that agriculture is missing in a lot of places. Number two, we want to increase our plant diversity. Number three, reduce tillage. Number four, we want to reduce the use of synthetics. And number five, we want to have livestock integration. So what I've done is, you know, between all of those, I, the soul armor is important, but I've included it between the living root and, and reducing tillage. So keeping that living root of a plant in the vegetative stage throughout the growing season. So the reason why we want to do that is when a plant is in the vegetative stage, what it's going to do is it's going to be photosynthesizing along. You're not going to have a huge vertical growth in that plant, but what it's going to do is it's going to be capturing sunlight, producing uh, uh, you know uh, some some carbon chain molecules, whether it's uh, carbohydrate, proteins, uh, amino acids, oils, all this other good stuff. But it's going to be capturing that carbon from the atmosphere. When the carbon gets high enough in that plant, it's going to start releasing that back into the soil. When it's released into the soil, what it's doing is it's trying to set up the soil biology to be firing on all cylinders. When the plant's in the vegetative stage, it's not using a lot of nutrients, but it, when it gets into the reproductive stage, it wants to ensure that it's going to have enough nutrients in that soil 
to fulfill its life cycle. And it does that in the vegetative stage. It wants to build up that, that, that resource of, of, uh, of microbes. When it's doing that, and it's building the, the, the soil microbes and getting them firing, it's then cycling nutrients through the soil. And if we have a mixture of these vegetative plants, plus we have some plants that will be going into the reproductive stage, we're going to have this system firing on all cylinders. The other neat thing with having this, this low-growing plant that's in the vegetative stage, because it is you know, producing a, a lot of carbohydrate in, in that leaf, what you're going to find in those plants is your, your sugar to protein ratio is going to be quite a bit higher. And, and there's some work from Clayton Robbins showing that if we can increase that sugar to protein ratio and be in that two to one range, our rumens of those animals will perform more efficiently, which means we're going to have better gains. Increasing plant diversity. When we start talking about diversity, it isn't the, the variety of the the, the the, the crop that we're growing per se, but what we're looking at is the different functional plant groups that we're growing. So I've broken these down into three main groups. So we're dealing with our grasses, we're dealing with our legumes, and we're dealing with our broadleafs. Because the broadleaf category is so huge, I've broken down into brassicas, non-brassicas, and forbs. So just an easy way to, to break it into functional plant groups. Within each one of those functional plant groups, now we can break it down into more categories. So we're dealing with warm season and cool season species of each. So within the grass, we have warm season, cool seasons. Within that warm season, cool season species, now we can break it down even further, looking at annual, biennial, and perennial plants of each. So the, 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 the opportunity to have diversity in these mixes is really really good so you know we really have to look at those functional plant groups how many of those can we check off when we say that we have good diversity in the field so to look at it visually uh you know this is a you know quick little triangle so there's our grass there's a legume there's our brassica non brassica and forms so when we're mixing up these blends and looking at diversity how many of those do you, can you have check marks beside Reducing tillage. When we do tillage in the field, and uh, the when we look at you know the the, the intensity and duration, those are going to be the two things. Uh, when when we say you know whether it's it's good tillage or bad tillage, when we do tillage, what it does is it increases the bacteria populations in that soil. When we increase bacteria populations in the soil, we increase our nutrient cycling, and in the case of nitrogen. Basically, if we don't have that green plant growing, what's going to happen is we're going to start getting a buildup of nitrates in the soil. When we have a buildup of nitrates in the soil, what that's going to do is going to give us very quick plant growth, which is going to lead to lodging. But more importantly, that's going to increase our annual weeds growing. So most of our annual weeds that we have in our cropping systems are driven off of either low calcium uh, availability or it's due to high nitrates in the soil, free nitrates in the soil. When we have tillage, the other thing it does is it destroys the fungal hyphae. And so that decreases our fungal populations. When we have decreasing fungal populations, this decreases our soil aggregate stability, which means now we've lost our soil in or water soil water infiltration. That is, you know, a, a huge problem that we're having right now because one of the things when I'm talking to people and uh, you know just talking farming in general I've heard way too many times where farmers tell me the most important piece of equipment on their farm is the traco so they can get rid of that water which is crazy because we've had more droughts in western Canada than we had years where we had too much water and we have that too much water, once again, infiltration is the problem, not too much water necessarily. 
The other thing with tillage is it breaks down organic matter. And that breakdown of organic matter comes from that increased bacteria population where if you don't have that living root feeding carbon into the system, the bacteria and the fungi are going to be feeding off the soil organic matter and respiring that, that carbon from, from the soil. Reducing synthetics. When we are using fertilizer, we are outsourcing the jobs of our soil microbes through the, the, the evolution of our soils up till when, when settlers came out. The, the ecosystems were doing just fine. They were productive, you know, when, when, uh, there's, when you go through some of the, the records of, of some of the, the early explorers, they talk about, uh, you know, the, the grass being as high as, as the, the back of their horse or halfway up the horse. That's a lot of grass. Now we struggle to get our pastures to get boot high in, in, in some places. This is the reason why we've, you know, we have to take a look to see what our natural ecosystem is, is doing. So, you know, fertilizer, why do we need the fertilizer? If you listen to Dr. Elaine Ingham, she says, if you look at a, a Sparks test or a Reams test, which instead of telling you what is, is uh, the, available to that plant, it takes a look at to completely what minerals you have in your soil. And in most cases, unless you've eroded your topsoil away, we have enough nutrition in our soils for between one and 2000 years of plant production. The issue is, is when we do a conventional soil test, it tells you what our plants can get. And so that difference is what biologically, what can that plant get out of the soil? And so whenever we have deficiencies, normally it's because we have a lack of diversity in our soil microbes. Seen some, some numbers from the fundamentals of soil ecology book one ton of synthetic nitrogen will gas off about 30 metric tons of carbon dioxide out of the soil and that's because when we add synthetic nitrogen or synthetic fertilizers that when it hits the soil it needs to be converted into a plant available form and that that has to go through the microbes because you and i are biological creatures when we have nutrition when we eat something it is always associated with a carbon molecule. So when we have synthetic nitrogen, we're just putting straight N down or P or K or S, we don't have it linked to a carbon source. And so it has to go through this mic microbiological process of converting it into a form that these plants are able to take up. And so this is where, if we do have to add some fertilizer, some nutrition, let's have it in a form that we have carbon associated with it. When we look at synthetic phosphate, when we seed place synthetic phosphate, the plant identifies free phosphate in its root zone, and so it stops mycorrhizal fungal infection, which is really important because when we have the the a mixture and we have a legume and a grass growing together ec ecologically through evolution they work together so the legume will fix nitrogen but in order to fix nitrogen it needs some phosphate for the atp cycle to for energy grasses they have a big larger root system they accumulate phosphate but they need nitrogen so through evolution co-evolution co uh, these plants will grow together the grass will accumulate phosphate move it through the mycorrhizae into the legume the legume takes that phosphate produces fixes some nitrogen and then shuttles that nitrogen some of that nitrogen back over to that grass so we have a nice working system fertilizer starts breaking up that that relationship when we start looking at insecticides most insecticides that we're using they're they're not overly specific so they will kill any bug that's out there whether it's good or bad so that when we start looking at the the, the when we have a pest outbreak number one what's happening in that in that plant is we have low soluble carbohydrate we may have free, uh, too high of nitrate when we have bugs showing up that means we have a sick plant and when we have a sick plant you know the the whole uh, i read in one of the books that in nature 
your bugs and disease are the garbage keepers of nature. So if there's uh, if you have a sick uh, garbage plant, that the, the bugs and the, the disease are going to get rid of them for you. So, you know, once again, is it the cause or the cure? Uh, it, it's just an indication that our system's broken. When we look at fungicides, same sort of thing. It, it nukes your fungi. Uh, you know, if it's a contact or a systemic type of, of fungicide, it's going to influence how much damage happens. But when we, if it's systemic, what's going to happen is that that plant is going to soak up the fungicide. It's going to nuke the fungi that's in it. And because of systemic, it's going to move into the roots, kill off your mycorrhizae fungi, and potentially get leached into the soil to clean the the, the, the rhizosphere. If it's a contact uh, fungicide, what the, the risk there is, okay, so you spray it on, so it's going to clean up your fungi, your fungi on, your, on your plant, but now it's in your tissue. So when you have that residue go back onto the soil surface, what's going to happen is it's going to rot and it's going to release the fungi or the fungicide into that soil, which is then going to kill the fun, fungi, which means your straw is not going to break down. So now the next question is, okay, so now we're going to be feeding straw that's been sprayed with fungicide. What does that do to the gut of the animal that we're feeding it to? So, okay, that's all fine and dandy. So, you know, we want to reduce synthetics. But what we have to do, remember, is we need to earn the right to reduce our inputs. So if we're going to be going back to monoculture barley, we're going to have to be putting nutrients down. We're going to need to be buying these synthetics. When we start doing these, these polycropping, when we start dealing with diversity, now we're earning the right to reduce it. So livestock integration. This is one that, you know... Everybody is saying, okay, yeah, we're, you know, we're doing a good job. We have livestock. But the issue is, uh, you know, the, the, it has the potential of fast-tracking soil health. You know, you have living root, you have diverse plants, you have the manure on the ground, you have the root exudates, everything works good. And if you look at this picture that we have up, this is something that, you know, that has an animal livestock in it in the last, you know, 30 years. But when you look at the soil structure, there is none. It's all platy. There's uh, there was no growth. There was it was six. It was dirt. Basically, it was what it was. And what was happening was it was overgrazed. And if you listen to uh, Alan Savory stuff, uh, he talks about partial rest, the uh, which you know is a, a serious problem. The other thing is too much manure, because now when we add that manure in, you know is you know what is your carbon nitrogen ratio of it. Uh, how much free nutrients are coming in in with it? Uh, so we really there is a that risk of having too much manure coming on the land also. So the proper livestock integration requires proper grazing management. And this nice little slide here is a really good uh, uh, overview of it. And and this is where when we look at regenerative agriculture and 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 looking at you know the grazing patterns of bison, the reason why I was interested in custom grazing bison versus beef is because they are nature's mob grazers. They're in a tight herd. They're always on the move and they're grazing. Now the challenge is is to manage their movement so that you're allowing that plant to get full recovery, or at least half recovered. When we start going back and getting that second bite before that plant is getting back into the recovery mode is really setting back our plant stand. And when we when we have that second bite on the plant, more and more of that root gets sloughed off. Because when that animal comes in and grabs a, a mouthful or a tongueful of, of grass and or legume or forb, it's going to be ripping out some of the roots whether it's root hairs or secondary roots or whatever. So it dies and it, it it gets decomposed by the bacteria. You have the root exudates, you have the manure, you have the saliva. That whole system works. As you start overgrazing it, and overgrazing it is getting that second bite before that plant is recovered, now that root structure, or that root zone is smaller, you have less root hairs, you get slower and slower recovery. So we what we need is to make sure we have, you know, the, the the grazing management so we're we're leaving you know the quick rule of thumb is leaving 50 percent of the that graze material back behind us 
Jay Fear at the, the American Farms down at Bismarck, what he did is he went out and he took different species and cut them in half. And the way you, you, you identify as, as half is you take that plant and you balance it on your finger. That's 50% by weight. So he cut it in half and, and he did some feed tests of the, the top half and the bottom half of the plants. And basically in, in every situation, in every one of these plants that we, he was testing, that top half of the plant is the stuff we want to eat. The bottom half of the part, the plant, is going to be lignified. It's going to have higher nitrates. It's going to have higher sulfates. It's going to, as soon as that animal is forced to eat that, that bottom part of that plant, you're going to be re reducing your gains. Alan Savory, when I was talking about partial rest, and this is where animals have free range over an area, and they're allowed to back graze on plants that have already been grazed without full recovery. And that's that partial rest. So, you know, some plants they're going to, they, they can preferentially graze, so they'll, they'll chew one plant like orchard grass, which will have a high bricks number as compared to a, a, a brome. They'll overgraze, they'll preferentially graze that, that orchard grass, and that's the reason orchard grass will then disappear out of a mix because animals will preferentially graze it out. And this is where using this electric fence to keep animals moving forward, what it does is it replaces the role of predators. And this is one of the things they found in the Yellowstone Park. When they introduced wolves into Yellowstone Park, the people with the, especially with the bison, they were concerned about, you know, the, the predation. But because the, the wolves were forcing the bison to keep moving, and they weren't just hanging out in the good meadows, they were seeing more diversity in these meadows because the, the, the bison weren't just sitting in one spot overgrazing them. So graze half, leave half is a real good place to, to be looking at to, to manage your grazing. Cover cropping is one of the tools we can use to help with soil health. So it's a general term. So basically what we're doing is we're going to grow plants to cover that soil. Now, when we start looking at actually implementing on, on our operation, first thing I always ask people, what is your goals? What are you trying to do? Are you grazing it? Are you haying it? Are you using it as a nurse crop as your, as, uh, for your forage crop? Or are you going to be terminating a hay or pasture and you're going to have that as a, a short-term buffer so that this way you know you're you're going to have that extra feed so because you're going to be losing a, a hay or, or pasture field that you're taking out. When we look at species, we're going to go back to, once again, looking at that diversity triangle. We're going to be picking species based on what our goals are. So whether it's hay or silage, if we're grazing it, if we're going to be looking at rotational grazing it or continuously grazing it, stockpiled, hay or grazed, do we want to have it winter killed or do we want that stand over winter? Are we getting, going to be dealing with young animals? Are we going to deal, dealing with uh, cow-calf pairs? What exactly are we going to be looking at? So then we can then devise a blend that's going to fit our needs. So our perennials, when we look at our perennial stance, one of the things that we should be looking at, and once again, this is some work through Clayton Robbins, is we should make sure that when we have this growth of our perennials, if we want to have a strong perennial stand, we should not be cutting or grazing through August, September, and October because we need those roots to get ready to overwinter for the next year. When we're grazing at that, we really take the nutrient supplies out of those, those roots and the crowns. And this is a, a, a prime time to have these cover crops and be grazing them during that, that period. So then it's going to help our... Our, our perennial stance. So not only that, but we're going to have something that is going to be more in that vegetative stage, which is going to have higher sugars, which is once again, going to help that whole system. The cover crops, a real good way to integrate, integrate, <laughs> incorporate livestock onto our grain land. And this is where, you know, whether it's a full season cover crop where we can do some rotational grazing it, and then the next year go straight into a, a, a cash crop, or we can do a, a, a post-harvest cover crop. So whether we have, say, Italian ryegrass and some, some Persian clover, in this case, this is a a, a, a spring triticale field so we can harvest the triticale and we have that Italian ryegrass growing underneath so then we can do some fall grazing on it. It also increases uh, to increase our, our plant diversity in those fields. So not only now, so we got away from this monoculture of, of 
of spring triticale. Underneath it, we have a, a biennial grass, and we have a, 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 a low-growing clover. We could have some chicory. We can have all this diversity, which once again doesn't mess up, in quotes, our cash cropping. It adds diversity. So then we have the opportunity to get those cattle, or, or bison in this case, out there to do some grazing on it. It makes our, our future cash cropping more profitable because with that manure, because of the diversity, now we're going to need less fertilizer and we're going to control our weeds way better because once again, when we can control our free nitrate in our soil and keep that to a minimum, we're going to see less and less weeds. We're going to see less lodging. We're going to see less all of these problems in agriculture that we have. The other nice thing about these cover crops is it will help extend our grazing season. Every time we hit that key on that equipment, it's going to cost us money. If these critters are out there and they're doing their own rations, and in this case, you know, we had about uh, 15 different species out in this mix. Uh, you know, so we had well, we had some some weeds sticking through it, which doesn't hurt my feelings because of, of plant ecology. It's telling me what's happening in the soil. But in this case, uh, if you see some some sweet clover, you see some chicory, and underneath that is a, a fairly thick sort of of uh, low growing grass. So these animals are out there; they're grazing. Uh, we're picking species like plantain that will retain their sugars late into the season. So. You know, these animals are out there and they're, you know, they're doing their thing. So just to kind of go through, once again, those five keys, that living root in, of a plant in the vegetative stage throughout that whole growing season, increasing your plant diversity, reducing the amount of tillage, reducing the amount of synthetics that are using, and incorporating livestock into your system. Those are the five keys that I, I live by. And when we're thinking of the soil, the rumen and the soil are very similar. When we are looking at, and once again, people laugh at me because I'm out there and I'm checking manure. I'm looking at uh, cow patties or bison patties out in the field. And, and that gives you a really good indication of how efficient that animal is, you know, is it getting the right blend of, of nutrition. When you see, and if you go to uh, University of Wisconsin has an app that you can take a picture of your 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 uh, manure patty, and it will give you a score on it. And basically, you want nice and round. You want an inch, inch and a half in in uh, in height. But you know the one on the on the left, pretty good manure 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 patty. That means that that room is running pretty good. The one on the right, you can see that it's kind of piled up a little bit. So this is what it tells you is that that animal is getting maybe a little bit too much fiber. Um, you know, it needs a little more, more green in it. On the other hand, if you're going into metabrome and it's really lush and growing fast, and if Bessie has a cough, you have to make sure you see her eyes and, and not the, the back end because, you know, it's going to be very loose. That means that she needs more fiber in her, in her diet. Same as the soil. If we keep feeding, and once again, in, in modern agriculture, when we grow a wheat crop and we return all that straw back into the soil, what would that animal's manure look like if we took all that straw and just fed that straightly to that animal? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be working very well. Whereas if we had something green underneath that wheat and we had some diversity then our manure patties would look more round. It would it look like a functioning, the, the rumen would be functioning properly. And this is what we have to think about when we're feeding our animals, we're feeding our soil. And what we're feeding our soil is going to determine what our soil is going to be looking like, just like the rumen. So that's that's a, a quick quick way to, to see, you know, how your, how your soils, how you're feeding your soils, and, and is it going to be proper. And this is the whole thing with egg culture. It doesn't matter if it's, um, you know, livestock or grain or mixed farms. We have to remember that if we only focus on the problem, we might miss the easy solution. 
And this is what I'm seeing in ag culture right now is, you know, everybody's hitting the, the, the easy button of the, the synthetics and, and, and fertilizer. There's a better way. And part of it is the livestock integration. It's increasing diversity. It's uh, reducing tillage. It's it, it's all of those those five principles. And when you put them all together, then life becomes so much easier. When we get that that soil functioning properly, and this is where people will rip up a, a pasture or hayfield because you know it's it's tired. Well, it's it's tired because it has the wrong microbial balance. We don't have you know, if, if we don't have the water infiltration, okay, so we need to try and build up our, our, our fungal components. We have to, we have low productivity, so we have to increase our, our bacteria. And how do we do that? It's basically, we have to wake up our soil biology. That's the, at the bottom line. So I'd like to thank, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, here's uh, some contact information for Imperial Seeds. And, uh, I uh, hope, hope you enjoyed it.